Hi everyone, um, welcome to SGN and ULC Technologies collaborative webinar on revolutionising roadworks with RES, which stands for Robotic Roadwork and Excavation System. Um, I'm Alex Pender, the Marketing Specialist at ULC, and we'll be hosting the session today. It's great to see so many people on. We have over 100 people here with us today, just from a range of industries and all over the world. So hope you enjoy the webinar. So at today's event, we'll be hearing from four industry experts, both from ULC and SGN. Kicking us off today will be Robert Kodadek, who's the president of the ULC businesses, to provide an introduction. And then we'll be taken through the project background and the benefits of the system by Ollie Machen, who is the RES project lead at SGN. We'll then get to see the system from concept through to development with Dr. Ali Ismari, who is the RES engineering project lead at ULC. And we recently undertook some field trials in the US. So in this section of Ali's presentation, you'll get the chance to see first-hand footage of the system in action. John Richardson, who is the Head of Innovation at SGN, will then walk us through the vision and the roadmap of the system before we go live to see a walk around of the platform. So make sure to stick around for that. Um, following that, we'll have a panel discussion and a Q&A session, which will be hosted by David McLeod, ULC's Head of Business Development. Um, but we're really excited about having the webinar for you today. Um, we want to make it as engaging as possible. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask the panel, then please submit them in the Q&A function and we'll try and pick them all up in the final session. And um, we're also going to be asking for some audience participation throughout the webinar. We've got three polls, so please get involved in the discussion when they pop up. Um, and I'll introduce you to our first speaker today, Robert Kodadek, who's on the screen. So Robert is the president of ULC and is responsible for the R&D group, the US and UK field operations and general business management. Before his role as president, Rob was the chief technology officer for ULC Robotics and holds over 20 US and international patents, a dual degree in electromechanical engineering from Wentworth Institute of Technology and soon will hold an MBA from MIT. I pass over to you, Rob. Great, thank you, Alex, appreciate it. So thank you all for joining and taking the time from your busy schedules to attend our webinar on the robotic roadworks and excavation system. First, I'd like to thank our project partners, SGN and Offgem, for their support of this revolutionary robotics development. I'd also like to thank the amazing ULC project team and everyone who contributed across the ULC business. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with ULC, we're a technology development company which forms collaborative partnerships with energy, utility, and industrial companies to solve very tough challenges. We work from the napkin sketch all the way through commercialization. We support the complete life cycle of new technology-based products and services. We have incredibly skilled and experienced electrical, mechanical, software, and sensor engineers on staff, along with program management and in-house fabrication and prototyping capabilities. Our goal is to gain a deep understanding of our clients' challenges and then, through our field ops group, commercialize valuable products and services for our partners and the greater market to ensure that the value that's created is actually realized. We work on complex technology, which includes robotics, AI, software, non-destructive sensing, and we even design and build our own aircraft. Today, we're here to present the robotic roadworks and excavation system. So I can remember when Greg Penza, ULC founder, and I sat in our conference room nearly five years ago, brainstorming how to revolutionize excavation. Now with support and collaboration from SGN and Offjam and a lot of hard work from our team, we've been able to realize this vision. For the last three years under a collaborative project, we've combined the latest AI and machine learning technology, below ground sensing, and the most advanced factory automation techniques with construction grade robotics. The result is an all-in-one solution for excavation. So during this session, we'll discuss the project, the technical features of ARES, we'll show some videos of our latest field trials from here in the US, and explore the benefits of the system in the context of excavation. But although the initial focus was on street works and excavation, it should be noted that the RES is a platform. It's capable of combining the precision of a robot arm, long life battery power, onboard computing, wireless communication, stereo vision, AI and sensing all in one package. So what you end up with is a platform capable of picking up 225 kilograms, reaching three meters above and around its base or two meters directly below the ground. 
So the possible uses for this platform in construction, utility and energy is endless. So we have participants in the webinar from a variety of industries. This is gas, water, rail, construction, electricity, and transport, also from across the world. Some participants from Australia, the UK, the US, Europe, and even Hong Kong. As we move through the webinar, I just ask that you think about different applications that the platform can be used for in your industry. We're always looking for new partners to develop new applications for this system and for opportunities to pilot the robot in different environments. So thank you again for joining and please enjoy the session. Thanks, Rob. Um, and up next, we have Ollie Machen, who is the RES project lead at SGN. Ollie has over 15 years of experience within the gas industry and initially with various roles in network strategy before moving on to project manage R&D and innovation projects. Ollie works on various NIA projects, which focus on records, asset risk, IT and planning. And now Ollie is the res lead and works to advance keyhole technology. So I'm passing it over to you now, Ollie, to provide a bit of background on the project. Thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, for, for those of you that, that don't know, um, SGN is a, the second largest gas distribution company in the in Great Britain. So we provide services to about um, six million, just over six million customers, I think, at the moment, um, covering you see about seventy five thousand kilometers of pipeline. I think. Uh, as Rob said, a lot of people on uh, the call today will be from a utility kind of background, whether that's GB or, or internationally. Um, SGN are, you know, the, the mainstay of what we're doing is is trying to ensure that our gas pipeline infrastructure is uh, sound. Uh, we have a big replacement program that is ongoing, but we spend a lot of time uh, uh, creating uh, entrance to the assets, either to inspect them or to um, regenerate them or to replace them. Um, and so <clears throat> with the support of Ofgem, which is our regulator, um, we, under, we, we, we initiated uh, this project, we bid for it. It was, uh, it was about uh, six million pounds uh, and we were successful. Uh, Ofgem, you know, really underrated program and I see um, it's really stimulated a lot of uh, additional innovation activity um, within the industry. It's, it's created a lot of new technology. Um, Res just doesn't re doesn't just represent a, a single platform. There's a lot of technologies that you can extract and use. You know, potentially standalone. Um, we kept the tooling completely open source. So we're hoping that you 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 can you can see some of the, the benefits of, of using the system. It's about been about four years, four years in development, um, including some some additional time. Um, and really, I, I just wanted to take you through where where we see, you know, the, the big wins for the for the system and, and what we were what we were pushing for. So critical and, and, and at the top is, is is enhanced safety for us. So Res really represents the ability to for the first time conceive fully automating um, a roadworks operation in full, a hands-off. And, and there's, there's a couple of aspects to safety for us uh, in the industry. The first one is, is HAVS regulations, which are, which are hand-arm vibration. Uh, and this really gets to the heart of, heart of, you know, when you've got employees that are working in um, environments where, you, where you're using them physically, you're, you're looking for physical labor, you know, you're not going to be, it's, it's quite clear that we're not going to be able to detriment that person and you shouldn't expect to be able to detriment that person, you know, for pay effectively. So Res starts to address that issue. It, it, it's going to move people from, from low skilled to, to upskilled kind of work. Now, we know that they know what they need to do. We're just going to give them great new tools to do them without them having to physically detriment themselves. The second which we have with safety is uh, quite often cable strikes okay so we're working in the ground alongside electrical infrastructure when we're working on gas mains um, it can be fairly devastating to clip a cable with a road breaker quite often we can find cables that are, are seemingly in good health until you uncover them and then they go to fault um, through through no real fault of the operative and res again takes the operative out of the excavation so anything happening in there with gas with electric they are removed as an observer, um, an overseer of the system as it goes. 
So, so big wins on, on, on the safety front. What else does it bring us? Well, if you're automating the process and we've done fantastic work with the AI relating to the system, it means we can lower or eliminate the damage risk. All right. So there's potential cable strikes, the, the inadvertent, um, you know, breaking of fiber optic cables. The system is always looking, it's completely aware of what it's working around. And so you can program in the fail safes that perhaps a person wouldn't be able to coordinate and effectively doesn't coordinate very well. So we can, we can, we can lower that risk. Kind of coming hand in hand with that is, is the efficiency of the system. So although the situation on the ground might have variables to do with what it is that you're doing, effectively you can task the system to, to achieve a, an outcome and it will work within those variables. And so what you get is a very repeatable, uh, efficient system. One that you can rely on in terms of timing <clears throat> and one that you can know has worked to a standard the same, the, the same way every single time. Um, and because you're doing that, it really means that while you're there on the ground, you, you're minimizing the disruption of, of your activity. By definition, all the work that RES does is through keyhole, um, we're driving to have a, a, a full keyhole strategy for all our works. And we know that if we can work within the smallest possible size and shape of hole for each operation, then the benefit's going to be to our customers effectively because they're the ones that are usually disrupted by, the, by these works. You know, we're talking potentially from taking things that took three, four days just to three, four hours, potentially. So particularly in London and, and very urban areas, there's going to be a really big benefit for us just to come along, get the job done, reinstate and go. Um, and and the, the kind of last benefit is the, is the reduced CO2 footprint. So we've managed to make RES fully electrical. Um, there's no generation on site. Um, it's also working tetherless, which is a, a really big advantage in terms of its uh, movement and capability so we think that the the kind of reduced noise the reduced co2 is is a um, is a great advantage for inner city workings when you're getting pressures from from organizations like uh, tfl to to work much more efficiently um and it must be stressed again as rob said that i, I completely view these concepts and and, and project benefits as, as tr cross transferable and the obvious ones are to the other utility partners that we, we work with and when we'll be working with in the future, the elect guys and the water guys. Um, but equally, you can think of, I can think of many other examples where, because we've left the tooling open source, RES as a base system can come along and achieve any job within its specification. You know, so all of these benefits are definitely cross transferable. And, and I'll give you an example I, I looked at last week i was looking at the highways agency's website for innovation you know and they're talking about uh they need a they need a robot to put out the cones on the motorway more efficiently as safety instead of having a guy hanging off the back of a a couple of guys actually hanging off the back of a lorry putting the cones out and immediately red stands out as a possible solution to that which you wouldn't naturally think but when you you think of it out of the context of just just making holes in the road you can develop any tool to achieve any end-to-end -end operation maybe it includes the excavation process like we did you know to demonstrate it but equally you know very deployable in other scenarios okay and now i'm going to pass you to ali Thanks, Ollie, for starting us off with some background of the project. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're looking to have some audience participation throughout the webinar. So we're just going to do a quick audience poll. Um, so the question, when it pops up on the screen, please select one of the answers. So the first question is, which of the following would provide the greatest benefits to your business? One, performing reliable, safe operations, reducing environmental impact to CO2 footprint, reducing disruption to the public, alleviating third party damage, improving operational efficiency or accuracy when locating assets. So I'll give you about 30 seconds and then we can pop the results up on the screen.
So we can just end the poll there and we can see what the results are. So safety is one of the most important, which I'm glad everyone's a bit safety conscious on this. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for taking part on this first poll. Um, we can see obviously we had the majority there and these will be picked up during the panel session as talking points as well. Um, so now I introduce you to our next speaker, who is Dr. Ali Ismari, the RES Project Engineering Lead. Ali is the Head of AI and Machine Learning at ULC Technologies and is currently the Project Engineering Lead for RES. Ali has an MS in Robotics and Automation and a PhD in Mechanical Engineering with specialization in Computer Vision and Machine Learning from Oklahoma State University. So over to you, Ali. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you wherever you're tuning in from. Thank you very much for your time and your interest in robotic roadworks and excavation system. Um, today I want to walk you through three years of development, um, all of the background um, deep investigation that we did into different aspects of our robotic operation. I want to show you videos of the robot in action from a couple of live demonstration that we carried out with the robot. And um, I want to talk about some of the capacities of the system and uh, the potential for future improvements and integration of other tools and systems into this robotic platform. Three years ago, when we started this project, we had this ambitious goal of creating an autonomous system, autonomous robotic platform that can carry out the entire excavation operation end to end. The goal was to do everything associated with excavation, starting from below ground sensing and identifying the locations of the buried assets, finding the best location for excavation uh, to expose the target assets, then cutting the road surface and removing the layer of concrete and asphalt that's usually on the top layer excavating the soil that's above the assets through a very safe operation, at the same time autonomous, so there is less interactions with human operators getting involved in this risky type of task. Once the assets are exposed, we wanted to be able to carry out operations on these assets. Uh, what we have done under this project is we developed tools for the robot that can install a fitting on a gas pipe under the ground once it's exposed through a keyhole. And then once the operation is completed, backfill recycled material into the keyhole and reinstate the core that was taken from the road surface. So what I'm about to show you is video footage of us doing all of these steps using the robotic roadworks excavation system, the first ever prototype that can carry out all of them autonomously. And um, at the end of um, my presentation, if you have any questions, send us through, and then we're going to go through all of them, and I'm trying to address all of your questions. If you stick around for the very end of this uh, presentation, we're going to give you a live demo of the robot as well, where some of our operators are right now testing uh, the robot. So the core of robotic roadworks excavation system is a six degree of freedom robotic arm mounted on tracks. What we have done is we created all the essentials for the robot to be able to operate autonomously, remote and untethered. We have a battery compartment within the system. We have all the electronics control system and wireless communication on board. So we basically have a robotic arm that usually works in a factory environment on the road. Now it's an open source system, so we can integrate different tools and end effectors to carry out operations like below ground sensing or cutting the road surface or other tools that can help us to do excavation. And as um, Ollie and Rob talked about, there are so many other possibilities for this platform to carry out similar operations. The idea again was to create an open source platform that's capable of doing a variety of things. One of the main aspects of our development was the power system for this, uh, for this robot. We wanted to make sure the robot is on tethered and is operating um, using electric power. What we did is we integrated 16 independent batteries. These are lithium iron phosphate batteries, top of the line. Combined, we have created 35 kilowatt hour worth of um, power in this system. 
on board of the robot, we have converters that, that turn this uh, electric power from DC to three phase AC. So we're able to do very, um, um, very intense operation like cutting the road surface or um, articulating a robotic arm that's usually powered by a three phase AC in a factory environment. This allows us to take the robot in any location. Now, um, this battery pack can be charged within a couple of hours, three to four hours to bring it to full charge. And based on the type of operation that we are doing, it gives us enough power to run eight hours of operation nonstop, which we estimated we would be able to do two keyholes back to back, which you are gonna see in this videos that I'm about to show you. Uh, so the first step um, when we started the project is to design this platform. Three years ago, when we started the development, we had the idea of putting the robot arm on a track mounted platform. That was basically the start of everything. But throughout our development, we started looking into environmental um, scenarios that the robot needs to operate in. The footprint was a big deal for us. The weight of the robot was important. The, capa the load capacity on the robot to be able to carry out very aggressive operation on the road surface was also very important. So we started kind of like making modifications. The second iterations of the robot was a smaller platform where we had different tools on board of the robot platform. So the robot can grab them from back of its tool cart and carry out operation. As we grew into development of different tools and identified that we need more tools and we want to create an open source platform and we want the robot to be as light as possible, we started shrinking everything down and bring it to bare minimums and having tool carts coming in and out and providing the robot with different tools to carry out a variety of operations. Later, we started looking into the form factor of the robot to make it weatherproof and be able to operate it remotely also providing enough space for the electronics and all the components internal of the robot to be able to provide any type of power, compressed air, water for any um, kind of aggressive operation that we were planning to do with the robot. Um, we went through different transitions of this cover. We were doing fabrication, testing, and improvements. And finally, this is the final design of the robot. Again, it's the six degree of freedom robotic arm mounted on tracks with all the electronics and power system, including the battery pack that I talked about um, on board of the system. We have provided ca capability for the robotic arm to reach on both sides and carry out operation um, within a very wide, wide range, uh, about 180 degrees. As Rob mentioned, the robot is capable of picking up up to 225 kilogram worth of load extended to three meters off from its center. The robot can raise different tools and assets above its footprint or two meters under its footprint. So the options are, there, there's like, I, I mean, what we are trying to do is make it an open source platform so we don't have any limitations. Uh, for adding more tools and options to this system. Now, before getting into the videos and showing you the operation of the robot, I wanna talk about like the test environments that we created for the robot to validate its operation and test its cap capabilities. At the beginning of the project, we identified uh, different types of assets that are usually buried under the ground in urban areas, highly congested area, urban areas like London, like New York City, um, and then try to create these mock roadways, a simulated environment for the robot to be able to test it in kind of like a real life scenario. We created uh, two um, small roadways. These are about 30 feet by 30 feet areas. We dug deep and buried different assets with different sizes and material. We have steel pipes of different dimensions. We have uh, PE pipes. We have cable conduits with powered lines going through them. We have fiber optic cables in this ground. Um, as we laid these assets down, we filled out the, the roadway with different types of soil combination, clay, sand, mixture, and uh, compacted them and put these assets at different heights with different orientations. So what you see here in the bottom picture is the robot doing some tests at one of these mock roadways. 
after compacting the soil on top of these assets, we overlaid it with nine inches of concrete and then on the very top three inches of asphalt to again, simulate a worst case scenario for the robot to carry out its operation. As Rob mentioned two weeks ago, we carried a live field trial uh, where we demonstrated all aspects of operation uh, in a real uh, kind of like a life scenario at one of these mock roadways. The picture that you see is the mock roadway. We put a tent over it to weatherproof it to allow us to do any type of operation in the current weather that we have in New York. So the operation was live. We carried out end to end, beginning to the end of this excavation um, process. The robot starts by mapping the assets under the ground and then carries out roadworks, cutting the road and removing a core from the road surface. Once the soil above the assets are exposed, we agitated the soil and removed them layer by layer until the assets were exposed. Then we carried out operation on these assets and then at the very end reinstated the road with recycled material and put the same core back in its place, preparing it for finish up touches. So I'm going to jump into these videos. I just wanted to set the stage up for what you're about to see. So the first part of the operation is below ground sensing. Here you see the robot in all of these videos, the robot at, in this Mark roadway under the tent. What the robot is doing right now, it is uh, carrying a suite of sensors and dragging it on the ground, very similar to a traditional non-destructive testing but with so much higher resolution and precision to collect data from, from all the assets that are under the ground. The operator essentially identifies a safe zone in front of the robot for scanning where we're expecting to see the assets of interest. The robot sweeps the ground using these sensors. On board right now, we have a ground penetrating radar and EM sensor together. Robot is providing power uh, to the sensors and then capturing all of this data, high resolution through a computer that's on board of the robot. All the information about the operation is then transferred to a remote um, station where another operator is overlooking the robot's operation. In the bottom left corner of the video, you see a simulated environment, a kind of like an animated version of the robot, but it's the real robot where uh, and it's real poses with the type of sensor that the robot is carrying. What we are doing here is we are not only scanning the robot using traditional methods of dragging the sensor over the ground, but we are able, because of the precision of the robotic arm and the six degree of freedom, we, we are able to adjust the polarization of the antenna to any degree that we are interested in. As the data is being collected, everything is being transferred to a remote device on the side. Now, once the data is completely collected, everything is geotagged, and then the robot autonomously process the entire raw data set from ground penetrating radar and EM sensor, and then creates a 3D point cloud of the assets in front of the robot where the scan happens. So this is now a shot of the user interface where the operator is interacting with the robot. What the operator is seeing is a 3D point cloud in front of the robot, that yellow mark is showing the zone that the scan took place in. Now the operator, we have provided different tools for the operator to clean out this data, eliminate noise and filter out specific regions and identify the best location for potentially excavation and carry out the next piece of the operation. So here our operator is using the user interface, eliminating some of the noise, uh, removing the background noise, adjusting the depth that we are interested uh, to see the results in. And at the end, you have a 3D model of the assets under the ground. What you see here is very clear and visible is a pipe that's going perpendicular to the orientation of the robot and two pipes that are crossing it. And this information can be used, this 3D model information can be used to estimate the depth of where the assets are and also potentially down the road, collect enough data for development of machine learning models that can autonomously detect potentially the type and sizes of these pipes under the ground. 
going to the next step. So the idea of sensing, below ground sensing was to identify the assets, identify potential obstruction in the way of excavation and find the best location for cutting the road. So the next step is uh, for the robot to use different tools to cut the road. But before that, the operator uses the user interface and identifies the best location to carry out this keyhole excavation. As you can see, the operator is dragging around a simulated core in the area while looking at the 3D point cloud. And in this case, we decided to go after that crossing of the two pipes, trying to expose that and show the accuracy of the sensors and uh, calibration of the robot to achieve a specific spot under the ground. The next thing is uh, to cut the road. What our operators have done is they have attached a tool cart to the robot. I'm gonna pause here real quick and talk about what's going on um, in this video. So the tool cart is attached to the robot. Um, there's going to be a lot of operators going in and out because Again, it was a live demonstration. I was around with a microphone trying to explain every step of the operation for people who were tuning in. But uh, what you will see is a lot of crews of people, our operators going in and out, just because we wanted to fit in six hours, five to six hours of operation in a three hours demonstration. What we have designed here is a robotic platform and a process that can be carried out by two operators on site. Now, because we wanted to speed up the process, we had multiple crews of people, multiple pairs of operators doing things at the same time simultaneously to save up some time. So uh, with that, let's go and see what the robot is doing. The cart is attached to the robot. The first tool that the robot is picking up from its tool set is a core drill that allows the robot to cut a pilot hole from the road surface. Usually the pilot hole is taken out of the road surface to estimate the combination of the top layer, the thickness of the concrete or asphalt that might be on the top, and also use it as a leverage point to grab the core after it's completely detached from the ground and pull it uh, out of the keyhole. So the robot uh, brings the core drill to the specific spot that the operator has identified through uh, processing the sensor data. Now the robot knows the exact coordinates of every single point in its, the vicinity of the scan area. <clears throat> so the core drill is going to the center of that cylindrical core that the operator selected. Then the robot applies a constant downward force on this tool. Um, so it descends the tool down into the ground looking for the forces. And as soon as the, co the core drill goes through the entire thickness of the concrete and asphalt, the robot senses the force, pulls the tool out, and now we have the pilot core out of, out of the, the road surface. The next step is uh, to cut this core out of the ground. So the robot puts the tool back in the tool cart that's attached to the side of the robot. Again, you can here see how the operation is being done autonomously. And what our operators are doing is just supervising the operation, making sure the robot is doing its thing. Um, after the core drill is dropped off, the robot picks up the next tool, which is an aggressive chainsaw for cutting the road. One thing I wanted to mention before the robot picks up this tool is that we created an autonomous tool changer method for this robot to be able to in integrate with different tools that are designed for different types of operation. So through this robotic arm, through this cable carrier that you see in front of the robot, uh, we are providing different tools with different levels of power. For example, in, or in the case of a core drill, we are providing high current AC power. In the, course, in the case of a sensor, we are transferring very sensitive high frequency sensor data through a coax cable. We are providing water through this cable carrier to a specific tool. And all of this communication, this contact is happening within a couple of seconds as soon as the automatic tool changer comes in full contact with the tool. So not only we are mechanically securing a tool that can weigh up to 150 pounds with the robotic arm, but also providing it with enough power and data communication uh, necessary to carry out its operation. So the chainsaw is picked up. I'm going to talk a little more about like the, the design of the chainsaw, its power and its capacity. 
um, right now I want to focus on what the operation looks like. So the core has been identified. Its location is known, its perimeter is known. The first thing that the robot does is it goes through a circular pattern, scaling the ground, cutting slightly the perimeter of the core to be cut. And then later the robot goes into um, multiple plunge cuts to almost loosen up the surrounding of the core from the road surface. Here is a time-lapse version of this operation. I wanna mention the entire operation is happening autonomously. The robot has force torque sensor that allows it to identify how much force needed to be put behind the tool. And the speed of the operation is very dependent on the hardness of the, the concrete that we are cutting. Now here, the robot paused for a second. This is a routine maintenance that our operators carry out every once in a while to tighten the chainsaw. This is kind of like an intrinsic um, um, a maintenance routine for any type of concrete cutting chainsaw. Once our operators see that their chainsaw needs tightening, it takes about uh, one to two minutes to tighten the chainsaw and then the robot carries out the rest of the operation from exactly the same spot that it was left off. You can see the water is being pumped through the chainsaw and dripping down. So this water is being provided from the robot arm going through the, in, the uh, surrounding of the engine that's actually running the chainsaw, cooling off the motor, and also being used to cool off the cutting bits on the chainsaw. So once the plunge cuts are completed, the robot goes into a um, routine circular pattern to clean up the surface of the core that's being cut. Um, every turn the robot does, it plunges a little more and carries out this cleaning procedure. The very last spot is the clean off plunge cuts. What we do is we don't cut the entire core in one shot. We cut, let's say if the core is 12 inches thick, we cut about 11 inches to not to let the water to go inside uh, the, the ground and contaminate the rest of the, the soil underneath. What we are doing is we're leaving the very last bit of connection between the core and the road surface for the very last plunge cuts, which you just saw the robot finished off. So now the core is essentially completely cut loose from the road surface. Now what the robot is doing is uh, dropping off this tool on the tool cart, fully autonomous. Our operators are there to um, supervise the operation and make sure everything is happening smoothly. Again, the same tool cart has everything necessary for cutting and removing the, uh, this core from the road surface. The next step is removing the core. Now, the robot has a, another tool which, uh, is used, uh, which is using pneumatic power to actually grab onto the core and pull it out of the, the road surface. So here you see the, the uh, ex core extractor tool plunged into the core, and then the robot is pulling out this core that we estimated should weigh about 160 to 180 kilograms. It pulls it out of the road, and then puts it aside. Um, here, I want to pause uh, for a second again before uh, getting to the next step while the core is being extracted. Um, as I mentioned, we kind of like doubled our crew to be able to speed up the operation. So we have a two man crew that are installing the next cart next to the robot for the next operation. We wanted to uh, eliminate any waste time. And then we have two man crew that are looking at uh, extracting the core. And these two operations do not have to happen at the same time. So the core is completely extracted. Now, before getting to the next step, I wanna talk about a little bit about the uh, design of the chainsaw and the development. We started off this project again, three years ago with the idea of replacing the traditional methods that the cores are taken out of the road surface, which is using a core drum that has a lot of issues with cooling off the cutting bits or not being able to plunge through the entire uh, piece of the road surface in one shot. Um, we thought having a six degree of freedom robotic arm with that precision, if we can create an aggressive tool that can cut just as fast, would allow us to do different form cuts from the road surface. So this was the very first version of the chainsaw, what you see in the picture that we designed for the robot. And it actually proved the concept that we were able to very easily cut through any thickness of concrete more efficiently than a core drill. 
But we noticed that the operation was taking too long. With this tool, we, had, we were spending about an hour and a half to cut a 12 inch thick uh, concrete core, um, about 24 inches in diameter. So we upgraded this tool and make some improvements to it and then upgraded the uh, power to a uh, 25 horsepower electric motor. Now this motor is almost like the three times the size of a typical handheld chainsaw that a operator uses manually to articulate. The reason the chainsaws don't get any bigger off the shelf chainsaws are not uh, bigger than what we see in the market right now is because that's how much human operators can handle the amount of backlash and torque from the tool once it gets caught. But in this case, the robotic arm does not have any issue of carrying the load or the torque associated with cutting this aggressive um, environment. So we were easily able to upgrade this to a massive tool, did a lot of testing with it, and then identified we needed to do a lot of improvements on our robotic procedure to be able to articulate it freely to cut different sizes and shapes out of the road surface. So we upgraded to the third generation of the chainsaw. What we did here is we used the same engine uh, to run it electrically, but we integrated a seventh degree of freedom into the robotic arm. What you saw in that video is that the tool head, the blade could freely rotate around its axis uh, for uh, indefinite number of turns. And that allows us to articulate the tool, push it, and the robot can reach about three meters away from its base. So we can pretty much cut any shape away from the robot in any size, as long as it's, um, under 225 kilograms for the robot to pick it up. So as I uh, mentioned, after development of the first chainsaw, we had it to do a lot of work on the robotic aspect of the operation. This picture shows the very first core that we cut out of the ground. You can see the jagged edge is on this thing. This was basically a core cut with multiple plunges. This was the first proof of concept for us that using a chainsaw with a robotic arm can allow us to cut, cut different shapes out of the ground. Later, we improved our robotic operation. And this is the very first round core that we cut and pulled out of the ground. Um, from that point, we started um, pushing the system to its limits. As you can see here, we cut a ring within the road surface. This doesn't mean that cutting a ring has any benefits, but this shows the capacity of the robot to precisely cut any shape, any size with such a precision um, that it doesn't crack the concrete as a whole and keeps the integrity of the entire piece. We started pushing it to its limit. We started cutting cores as uh, wide as 36 inches in diameter, cutting multiple rings within each other in one shot. And uh, after, Improve, making a lot of improvements to the hardware and the, to the software aspect, we started being more creative and cutting different shapes out of the ground. So what you see here is an elongated core that's cut from the road surface. The benefit of this is in the keyhole excavation, in order to have enough room around the asset to carry out operation, like installation of a fitting, sometimes the asset might be too wide or the location might not have been picked exactly in the dead on the asset. So with an elongated core, we're able to give the operators more room around the asset or the robot more room around the asset to carry out um, other operations that require um, much wider tools. Uh, here is a picture of the robot pulling out a, an oval shaped core out of a slab, a concrete slab, reinforced concrete slab that we had in the lab. And finally, this is a 26 inch, I believe, diameter core that we cut out of one of our mock roadways. This is nine inches of co reinforced concrete and three inches of asphalt on top, weighed about 190 kilogram, and we pulled it out in one shot. So that's the evolution of the chainsaw. Let's uh, go back to uh, the rest of the operation. So the next step for us after exposing the soil above the buried assets is to remove this, uh, to agitate it and, uh, and remove it. 
What we try to do is developing a unique tool head that not only effectively agitates and removes the soil, but also doesn't cause damages to the assets that the third party assets that might be under the ground that haven't been identified through below ground sensing. So we went through different iterations and different prototype designs and fabrication. Every time we came up with a new idea, we started the project with the idea of using a rotary auger to agitate the soil and then remove everything using vacuum excavation. That was not very successful. Then we switched to using uh, compressed air to blast the ground and agitate the soil. But then we needed a lot of flow, airflow for that purpose. So we started uh, making the system more and more complicated. Uh, adding a rotary system to these nozzles so we can fire off different nozzles with a lot of them um, from the compressed compressor and uh, agitate the soil effectively. We still had a lot of issues. We switched to the idea of potentially articulating the nozzle and attacking the soil with different angles. And we found some merit to that. There were some successes. Uh, one of the uh, final ideas that we tried was integration of a supersonic nozzle into the excavator head. We basically acquired a supersonic um, uh, vacuum excavator nozzle that's off the shelf available, integrated it into a vacuum hose and started doing digging. Even though we found some merits in using this type of nozzles, but we were not still as effective as we wanted to do. So we looked into the fundamental design of these nozzles. We basically created an environment that we could simulate any type of nozzle using the same concept that are used in the jet engine to turn a compressed air into supersonic speed to create a very hard impact at the front where uh, the air meets the soil. So we simulated about 250 to 300 different design of these um, nozzles in the simulation environment. We try to improve and expand the amount of impact force that we are creating at the end on the soil and also the area that we are impacting with one blast of the nozzle. After doing multiple iterations, we started building different prototypes from some of the most optimized um, uh, supersonic air nozzles. And from our lab environment test, we identified the winners and then started integrating them into excavator heads. So here you see the very first excavator head that we designed for the robotic arm with integrated supersonic air nozzles. It's basically a pipe that's connected to a VACX unit we provided compressed air to one supersonic air nozzles and the robot was moving around trying to agitate and remove the soil at the same time. This was the very first autonomous excavation that we did. We were able to dig a small hole, but we couldn't expand the area. And we had a lot of issues with clogging these hoses. So we made uh, improvements. We made, we increased the number of these supersonic air nozzles. We made, we optimized the nozzle for the specific compressor that we were using for the excavation. We also created different robotic operation that would allow the robot arm to articulate this end effector in different orientation and agitate the soil from different angles. Um, later, we made more improvements, increased the number of, um, supersonic air nozzles. We also integrated everything within the robotic system. So the sequencing between firing these nozzles were controlled from the robotic arm and coordinating that with the motion of the end effector to have a very effective uh, exposure of the entire surface area with, these, uh, with this supersonic air. This is the very last um, system that we designed. After having a lot of successful excavation, we made a compact unit. So in this um, picture, what you see is our um, VACX unit connected to a hose that's in the center of this tool head. Around it, we have all the necessary valves for sequencing and controlling the supersonic air nozzles. And there are four hoses on the side of the tool head that are connected to these supersonic air nozzles. And then in front of the robot, we created a Cartesian cover that um, keeps the soil from spreading around after getting blasted by this uh, supersonic force. 
With that and seeing all the development iterations that we had to go through to get to this point, I want to jump into the video from the field trial. So back to where we left off, we cut the road surface, removed the core from the keyhole and put it aside. The operators also attach another tool cart to the robot where the robot can pick up the excavator head. Now, these are all the tools necessary for carrying out the excavation operation. As you can see, this is a relatively larger device. So what the robot is doing is first picks up the tool from the tool car and then brings it at the chest level for our operators to integrate any type of VACX unit that's available with this, uh, with the vacuum hose of the tool and also plug in compressed air to the valves. So what these two operators are doing is we have created adapters based on the type of VACX unit that's used. They're adapting the standard hose coming the VACX into the, into the tool head. And then the articulation and operation of the tool is being controlled by the robotic arm. So once the connection is completed, the robot picks up the tool. Again, in front of the robot, we have a Cartesian cover. You will see it in action very soon. But the purpose of that is to prevent soil from coming up after being uh, agitated by this um, highly supersonic compressed air. The yellow hose on the side in this video is the compressed air line that's provided to the tool as well. Now the robot is going again through a fully autonomous procedure based on the size and the location of the keyhole where the operator uh, defined earlier. The robot is going through an autonomous process, rotating the tool head 45 degrees. And every time it agitates, the vacuum removes the uh, pulverized soil and the robot descends the tool further and further down till it achieves the depth that the operator has assigned for it. Uh, one of the things I want to mention is we have a very sensitive force torque sensor at the end of this robotic arm. So in case the tip of the end effector comes in contact with an acid under the ground, it will immediately sense the forces and the anomaly, and, and it will retract the tool from the ground so the operators will be able to go in and look at the condition. So we are using compressed air, and we are also having this sensitive force torque sensor to prevent any type of damages to the assets. Now here you can see the keyhole with this. Uh, this is the crossing of the two pipes that we saw earlier in the uh, sensor data in the 3D contour map that we created from the uh, condition from scanning the ground. You can also see the surface of the core, the concrete core that's been cut from the road and also the assets that were about um, five feet deep into the ground. So the excavation is completed. The next step is carrying out operation on the pipe. So earlier we talked about the open source platform. This is up to this part, everything was common between different industries, electric, gas, water, sewer, they all carry out excavation operations. But then when it comes to the assets that's exposed, there are different types of operation that needs to be carried out. To prove the concept of this robotic system and the accurate six degree of freedom robotic arm being capable of carrying out very precise operation on these assets, we started with installation of an electrofusion fitting on a plastic pipe, a plastic gas pipe. So we identified a common pipe size in the UK and we buried that under the ground uh, at a certain depth. And then we created tools that right now are being operated manually by human operators when they get access to the pipe um, to peel off the surface of this plastic pipe, prep it for electrofusion of uh, a fitting onto the pipe. So what you see is the robot is, uh, excuse me, let me switch back to this video real quick. So what the robot is doing is descending down this tool head that's been designed for peeling off the surface of um, the pipe. The robot is on a force torque compliance mode where it's looking for the pipe. It's uh, once it grabs, once it identifies the pipe and it comes in contact with it, it complies with the orientation of the pipe and clamps tightly around the pipe. Now, the mechanism on board is a very standard system. It's a blade 
that uses a standard technique and cuts different layers of the surface of this plastic pipe piece by piece until it exposes a wide enough area on the surface of the pipe for installation of the electrofusion, uh, electrofusion piece. Um, a couple of things interesting to mention about this tool design is the design of this tool is utilizing only pneumatic motors. We were trying to stay away from any electromagnetic field uh, around the area that can potentially be hazardous. There might be gas leak. So there's nothing really um, risky about the tool that's carrying out the operation. The robot carries out this operation for about uh, five to 10 minutes, depending on the length that we need to expose for the fitting. Once the shaving is completed, the robot unclamps from the pipe and autonomously pulls the tool out of the keyhole. So here we have the prep surface ready for installation of the fitting. The next step is uh, putting the electrofusion fitting on another tool that the robot can articulate and uh, attach to this plastic pipe. This is a collaborative operation between the robot and a human operator. What our operator is doing in this video is he brings a standard um, electrofusion fitting, uh, place it at the end effector of the tool head, connects two leads that basically powers up, powers up this fitting, heat it up so that it can bond with the plastic pipe, scans the barcode. Again, these are following the same procedure that are standard in the market right now. Scan the barcode on the piece, clamps it down, and from this point on, the robot gets into an autonomous mode. What the robot is doing is now it's aware of the location, exact orientation of where the peeling action took place. Now it descends this uh, fitting down into the keyhole, looking for any backward forces. Once the uh, robot senses the pipe, it presses the clamp against the pipe. The robot can apply very accurate amount of force downward according to the specifications and standards on this um, fitting. While the uh, downward force is being applied, the two leads power up the fitting. The elements heat up the fitting and then the plastic, the two plastic pieces will bond. Once the bonding is complete, the robot releases the clamp around the fitting and then pulls out the tool out of the keyhole. And that's the end of installation of the fitting. So that's the fitting insulation. Once the work on the asset is completed, it's time to reinstate the, the road. I actually have to talk about something. We, uh, you might have noticed we did the excavation on, uh, on a specific keyhole and then installed the fitting on a different pipe. Uh, when we were designing the mock roadway, this was at the very beginning of the project. We didn't have that specific size pipe under the ground. We had a similar size pipe, but not that specific diameter pipe that's very popular in the UK. So in this mock roadway, we don't have that pipe of that specific size. What we did is later after development of the tool, we created another area to try and validate the universal access fitting installation, which you saw in the previous video. So given that the fitting is completed, now the next step is to reinstate the road. What the robot is uh, doing, again, very similar to the other operations, the operator bring in a tool cart that has that specific tool head for the robot. Uh, the robot gets in contact with this pneumatic compactor brings it to the center of the keyhole. The operators con connect a compressed air line to the excavator. They bring fresh recycled soil. They drop it into the keyhole and then the robot goes into an autonomous pre-written routine based on the size and dimension of the keyhole and compacts the soil in a rotary pattern. Um, every time the robot compacts one layer it comes up and allows the operator to dump in more dirt into the keyhole and then it compacts layer by layer till it achieves the surface that's ready for reinstatement of the core into the keyhole so once that's completed the robot drops off the compactor and then uh picks up 
The next tool, which is the core extractor tool for picking up and dropping off the, the core from the keyhole or into the keyhole. So the core extractor gets picked up, articulated by the robot. The robot goes back to the same spot that the core was dropped off the last time, enters the keyhole th um, through the pilot hole that's drilled in the center of the keyhole. Uh, picks it up and brings it to the location where the keyhole took place. Lines it up with the keyhole. And here I want to talk about some of the force compliance methods that we have designed for the robot. Now, this is a very heavy core. I mentioned about 160 to 180 kilogram. What the robot is doing is it descends it down, sensing different upward forces. It basically pushes the core into the ground, applying a very gentle downward force. And as soon as it feels any type of obstruction, it wiggles the core around a little bit in an autonomous way to identify the smoothest and best orientation to push this core back in its spot. So as you saw here, there was a little pause, the robot adjusted the uh, orientation of the, the core, pushed it in and it pushes it in until there is no um, force uh, pulling the core extractor anymore. Then it lets go of the core and pulls the extractor out of the core. And that would be the end of the operation. I have to mention one thing, this core came out in two pieces. The first piece was the 10 inches thick uh, concrete piece. And then there was a three inches of asphalt. What you see here in this video was dropping off the concrete core. Later, we dropped off the three inch asphalt piece on top of this concrete piece, which we don't have a footage for it, unfortunately. So that um, completes the excavation operation. Now, last but not the least, our team. Um, this was what you saw in all these videos and all this presentation was three years worth of work of um, more than 25 engineers, sensor scientists, technicians with different backgrounds, working on different aspects of this operation. Um, they worked through different technical challenges. Think they had to design, build, and create things that had never been done before. And at the same time, power through this global pandemic that we all had to deal with. And um, I um, feel very fortunate and honored to be part of this team and um, be a part of a team that develops such a cutting edge technology. And we're really looking forward to the future where we deploy this robot in field carrying out operations on a day-to-day -day basis in London, New York, or anywhere in the world. Thank you very much. I am going to switch to the next presenter. Thanks, Ali, and hope everyone enjoyed seeing the journey that we've had with Res so far, and of course, footage from our recent field trials. Um, so we're just gonna do another quick poll so please get involved when the question answers pop up on the screen. Uh, so our next question is, which feature of the platform do you think would be most beneficial in your industry? Reliable below ground mapping, safe and autonomous excavation, precision repeatable autonomous functionality, performing complete roadwork operations, or robotic arm rapid open source tooling. So again, I'll just give you about 30 seconds and we can see the results. Okay, I think we'll just end that poll there. Thanks for everyone for taking part. So the top answer again was safe excavations, um, but we got a good range across the, the different answers. Um, but just another quick reminder, so we're getting a lot of questions in. Uh, so please keep submitting anything that you'd like to ask our panelists for the upcoming discussions um, by using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. But next, I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker, John Richardson who is the Head of Innovation at SGN. 
John has experience in managing both technical and commercial risks associated with high value tenders, proposals and projects. John also has a Bachelor of Engineering in Mechanical and Electronic Systems, Masters in Law and Oil and Gas, MSc in Innovation, and is currently the Pipeline Industries Guild Scottish Branch Chair. So over to you, John. Thanks, Alex. So I'll be relatively quick and then we, we can go on to the, the important part for today, which is the, the for me the QA and the roadmap and the, the vision going forward. So as Rob and the team touched on earlier, the, the initial vision came through a discussion about conventional methods for excavation. Uh, the process obviously includes a number of risks and challenges to, to, to us all. Uh, th those include safety to our operatives as the process is labour intensive. There's intense planning through closing roads, liaising with local authorities, and sometimes arranging complex traffic management systems. Large excavations can also provide a lot of disruption to the public in general. And congested excavations uh, cause risk, a potential risk and damage to third party assets as well as the, the operatives. With this challenge in the backdrop, we, we were looking to provide a platform that enabled disruption of conventional methods via an open source platform. This would enhance safety and remove the operative from the hazard reduce the, the footprint, which would also increase flexibility of how we plan and perform our work operationally and make it easier for us to locate the assets. And, and also one of the most one of the, the, the key ones for, for myself is the use of existing data and, and future data from ASLA, as you know, can we enhance the use of AI to support operational decisions in the field. Uh, and with that, what's important is increase uh, number of uh, trials, field trials, and, and more importantly, in live environments, and we'll continue to develop the, the platform. Now, when we talk about the future, Rob had mentioned over five years ago now that this came from a discussion with, 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 with Rob and Greg, I, I believe, and they then engaged and developed a plan to deliver the platform with SGN. We're, we're now at the stage where we've, we've proven the concept and we've created an autonomous open source platform that does have the potential to increase efficiency without compromising safety and operational procedures. In fact, it, it would enhance the safety and it obviously reduces the environmental impact as well. We've also developed the tooling that can be used across a number of sectors. That would include the, the utilities, obviously the easy ones, the gas distribution networks, but other utilities, water, electricity, we're looking at construction, energy, and also infrastructure projects. And I can't stress enough, this is an open source platform. And there are many opportunities with a platform to challenge conventional methods. You know, an example that we're, we're talking about just now is can we perform multi-utility projects from one excavation or in close proximity uh, to another excavation to reduce the, the impact and the disruption as an example. Now, when we're looking forward to, as far as the roadmap is concerned, what's key in the, the, the not too distant future and, and this summer is the live field trials in the UK. This will heavily influence the implementation route that we take whilst being agile enough to, to continue to fast track any value added sy subsystems. Now, an example of that would be the, the vacuum excavation soft touch nozzle that Ali uh, presented a, a trial. We're actually already doing uh, parallel trials in partnership with Transport for London, ULC, SGN, obviously, and one of our, our main RepEx contractors. And that we, we took that approach because we've seen the value in one of the subsystems and products that had been developed, and we've fast-tracked that into an implementation trial. The next part of the roadmap would be engaging cross industry with subject matter experts to identify more applications for the platform. Ollie touched on earlier, we're looking to upskill and retain our key talent at SGN. And there's an opportunity for us to hire new talent and explore the art of the possible as far as the platform is concerned. We look to increase autonomous operations within intrinsically hazardous environments and, and take the operator out of that environment, even 
albeit it would be controlled. And going to my, my final point now, you know, why we're here today, we want to disseminate the outputs and knowledge gained from the project and move from proof of concept, which we've done, to an implementation plan, not only within the gas distribution networks, but across all other sectors. And to fully achieve the potential of the platform and technology outside of the gas distribution networks, we're also looking for collaborative partners to develop this with. And as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've got the platform is coming over to the UK in the summer and there'll be opportunities to do collaborative field trials. So, you know, please feel free to get in touch with, with some of the team that are on the call today. And before we move on to the, the Q&A, just a, again, you know, Ali mentioned that in his last slide, a big thanks to the team, you know, like some great efforts that's been on over the past three years. And before that, we, we were bidding for this project. The Ali and the team at ULC, and as well as Ollie uh, and the team at SGN. There's been some challenges along the way, but the guys have delivered, you know, a real good project, and we, we look forward to the next stage. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, John, and to the rest of our speakers today. Uh, but so now that we've seen the project from concept through to development and the roadmap of the system, it would just be great to do our last audience poll ahead of the panel discussion and the Q&A. So as John's just touched on, we're looking to collaborate with partners. Um, so can you think of any applications for the platform in your industry? So please just select yes or no. And I think we'll just look at the results now. So it's great, great results. To see that 93% of the audience think of, can think of more applications. Um, so as we mentioned, that we're starting to look for um, companies across all industries to engage with. So for those who selected yes, please look out for an email address that will show on the screen just before the panel discussion. And you can reach out to our teams directly to start these conversations. But now I'm very excited to share with you a live sneak peek of the platform. So I'll hand you back over to Ali. Thank you, Alex. Um, so it wouldn't be a proper presentation if you don't see the robot live in action. Uh, what we have done is uh, some of our engineers are at the site with the robot right now, carrying out different tests. I wanna mention what I talked about in the past like 45 minutes, half hour, was uh, really a sneak peek of some of the development and some of the capabilities of the robot. The time doesn't allow, I can talk about this system for days. So I'm gonna hand it over to Manny, one of our robotics engineers who is at the site right now, and he's gonna give you a tour of the robot in action. Thank you, Ali. Um... My name is Manny. I'm the robotics engineer for this project. I've been on the project for three years now. And my primary role is to program the robot arm. I'm here at the mock roadway that Ali mentioned with another engineer, uh, Lou, software engineer. And we're conducting some tests on the sensor package. So let me flip the, uh, the view so I can show the robot. So here's the robot. Um, so this is the robot. Um, right now it's conducting a uh, GPR and EM sensor scan. Uh, the GPR is the orange box that you see over there. And in front, you can't see it from this angle, but in front there's EM sensor, which is the small thin black box. The GPR is responsible for locating uh, underground infrastructure like pipes, metallic pipes and other, other made of other different materials, while the EM sensor can, can detect the current so it can locate the live cables. The two together in tandem can give us an accurate representation of the underground architecture. So one thing to note, right now the robot is applying a constant downward force onto the ground because this 
this sensor, typically in industry, is pushed on a cart where it is effectively dragged on the ground by its own weight and, and scans the ground. So in order to mimic this effect, we have the robot applying a downward force equal to the, um, the sensor's weight. Now this compliance, what this allows us to do is it, um, it allows us to contour any type of road surface. So if the floor is not leveled or it's perhaps at an incline or a decline, the robot will contour it and follow that path. Likewise, if it's, if it's very rough and, and has many peaks and valleys, uh, it'll contour that too. Now, this allows us for more versatile scans in, in that we can do it on many different types of terrain, but it also gives us better data because we don't have to worry about any potential compression of the sensor due to a not level surface. So now I'm going to just quickly walk around the robot showing different parts. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is the battery system. We use lithium ion batteries um, and those are located in a orange shell that you see right in between the tracks. Each lithium ion shell. Each lithium ion shell is, is housed inside of this orange casing and, and provides power to the rest of the robot. Uh, the track system, in an effort to be more eco-friendly and eliminate the risk of hydraulic fluid leaks, we've opted for electrical motors as opposed to hydraulic motors. And those are located behind this gear. They're not very, very visible because there's a casing. Here we have just a multi-purpose switch, which controls the power for the various components, as well as several e-stops and several set status indicators. So now I'm just gonna go around the robot and then um, go through each of the panels and show you what's to take a peek under the hood. All right, so the first panel, this is where the robot arm controller is. This is basically where all the programming on the robot arm is done. And as well as where all the wiring, where all the other external components get wired into the robots. You could see, you could see each of these plugs is a different um, system in and of itself. And it, all, and it all gets wired into the robot so that it can communicate and see it. The large panel consists of the three inverters that we have. The inverters pull the power from the batteries and then distribute it out to the arm. And it, we use three main inverters and then we have all the associated electronics for the power system underneath. The last panel is just a multi-purpose uh, rack where we have the different electronics that, that uh, go for the different tools. We have the GPR hardware. We have various relays. We have various external computers, um, power systems for the chainsaw core drill, um, as well as multi-purpose plugs for each of these um, systems. The robot also has an onboard compressor where it pulls air from for the various pneumatic um, applications. You can't really see it, but it's, it's located in the front. Basically, um, we, use the, we use air to attach and detach tools. And the tools, as Ali mentioned, are, are located on a tool cart and then the robot attaches them using air. So these are the brackets for the tool carts. Um, basically, um, they have mechanical stops so that the robot, uh, can, can, the tool cart can always be at the same position relative to the robot, regardless of its own orientation. And then you have some inputs for, you have air here, you have uh, 220 volt worth of power here, and 110 here, and then you have the water for the core drill and the chainsaw. Um, another thing I'd like to point out about the system is that using 
various sensors and uh, localization techniques, it doesn't matter if the robot is on an angle or not. Um, it uses an inertial measurement unit to, to basically find where it is relative to gravity and then creates a compensation for it. So no matter if the robot's at an incline or decline, it'll always operate perpendicular to gravity. So that's, that's basically it. Um, just a brief overview of what, what's going on in the robot. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Manny, for the great live demonstration of the platform. And I hope everyone enjoyed getting a closer look at the robot. Um, so we're just going to get into our panel discussion and Q&A session now. As you can see, that there's the email addresses on the screen. If you want to jot them down, then we can talk. You can talk to our team later on. Um, but we're going to get into the panel session now, um, which is hosted by head of head of business development at ULC, Dave McLeod. Uh, Dave is a chartered engineer with over thirteen years of experience working within the energy sector, um, in various roles including network planning and design innovation and operational management. And at ULC, David is responsible for business growth, identifying new market opportunities and increasing our innovation activities globally. So I'll pass you over to David now and would like to welcome our panelists back up on the screen. Hello everyone. On behalf of ULC and SGN, we'd like to thank you for tuning in to our webinar today. It's been great to see so many interested parties from a wide variety of industries across the globe participating. I hope that you've enjoyed a series of presentations so far, as well as getting an opportunity to see a live sneak peek of our robot in action. So thanks for that, Manny. So far today, you've heard from all our presenters on the evolution of the project, the benefits and the goals, the platform capabilities and the specifications, what's next in our thoughts and the roadmap of the platform, as well as how you can get involved in bringing the technology development to your industry in order to meet your overall um, operational needs. However, I'm sure that you're all wanting to learn a little bit more. Therefore, this, this is the reason for the panel session and we want to obviously thank everyone for participating and sharing some questions with us and we're going to do our best over the next 30, 35 minutes to try and cover as many of those questions as possible. And I've got the job of trying to group them all together into really topical themes and, and, and draw out the detail from these uh, professionals that are on screen now. So if I can ask uh, Ali, John and Ollie just to, to put their videos back on, please, and we can then uh, let's get into it. So I guess firstly to start, Ali, we'll start with you. You know, you've portrayed a very comprehensive overview of the system, its core capabilities and the specifications. But what was the greatest technical challenges that you and the team of you feel have overcome from delivering the solution over the last three years? Yeah, I would say um, one of the biggest challenges we had to deal with was doing precision work in an unknown environment. So what we have been doing is we took out a robotic arm that's typically rack mounted in a specific spot and carries out an operation from let's say point A to point B and repeats that procedure over and over. Now we put it on a mobile platform. We take it to an unknown environment, create perception for the robot so it doesn't collide into the obstacles. And then being able to have the same type of accuracy of operation I would say that was the biggest technical challenge that we had to deal with. But now that we have this system, now we have that precision on the road, we are able to do that same precision work that's happening in the manufacturing environment, but carry out all these operations outside. And we can integrate different tools to do very similar work with the same type of precision. Now, thanks, Ali. I guess, you know, just sort of touching on that, and there's been a couple of questions that have come in around that sort of precision. So take an example of the robot identifies something that's untoward. Um, how, does it, how does it really address that? And I'm, I'm more thinking around certainly the cutting and the excavation aspects of maybe the keyhole process. Could you just touch on that? Well, the robot has a same uh, coordinate system for every tool that it's utilizing. So within the boundary of operation, the robot is aware of every 
point under the ground or above ground. So what it's doing is it, it's providing every type of information that it's collecting from the environment to the operator, allowing to, the operators to make decisions about what is the next, next best move for the robot to carry out. Now, throughout this entire autonomous operation, we have put in checks and balances to make sure the robot is not going out of the script and doing something that the operator is not uh, requesting it to do. So at all times, there is one operator on the field that's looking at the robot's operation that able to um, abort the mission. There is an operator looking at the vitals of the robot, looking at the battery charge state, looking at the movement of the robot, looking at the amount of forces that are applied at the end effector and being able to abort the mission at all times. But then all that said, the robot itself has all of this intelligence within. The robot is aware of the amount of forces that are nominal and are expected to sense when it's doing a specific type of operation, like doing an aggressive cut with a chainsaw or the amount of force that needs to be applied during a soft touch excavation. And in case any of these anomalies come up, we come in contact with anything, the robot immediately pause the operation, retracts the tool and allow for the operator to uh, look at it, make a decision. And then once everything is cleared off, the robot can resume everything within the same platform with the same precision. Okay, thanks, Sally. Just Guess really, there's there's been a lot of questions, more probably for Ollie and, and John. Um, just thinking on the on-site environments around the robotic system, and I mean, Ali, um, obviously from some of your video content, you showed um, the system operating in a tent environment, but obviously that's uh, solely to protect our operatives uh, from. I think in the site environment that you were on, a lot of sand. But Ollie, John, do you guys just want to touch on? I guess. Um, how you envisage, you know, the on-site on operational footprint of the system, and uh, you know how many people ideally would be required to operate the system, Holly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm just looking at some of the questions. What we're trying to do is um, get some of these questions answered direct for you as well. Um, just looking at them, but but touching on a, on, a, on a few of them about that environment. Yeah, the, the system is designed to be outside. It's an industrial system. Um, the arm is a foundry condition arm. Um, so we're not shying away from any of the conditions that we usually find in, G, in GB. It's not anticipated that we need a tent over this thing to work, uh, quite the opposite. Um, yeah, we're not going to put it out like, as you wouldn't. You, you're going you're gonna to check conditions before you do works as you would with any. But yeah, it, it's, there, it's there to work in all conditions um, or, or that, that you'd usually find uh, in, uh, in the normal environment for work. Um, and, and this summer we'll be testing it, you know, in real conditions on live sites. Um, and that's what we're kind of hoping to do, uh, perhaps with some of you as well, while the, while the system is over. In terms of just sticking with that theme on, on site, um, yeah. from, from a noise perspective, uh, some of the people have sort of highlighted that obviously their operations um, yeah. typically are, are done through the night due to sort of heavy traffic conditions. Is this something that you believe that the robot's got the capability to do with the noise levels it performs? Yeah, definitely. It's something that TFL were interested in and when we've looked into, I, I saw a few questions about noise. The, the max we recorded is uh, was part of cutting and that's about 88 decibels. And, and so 88 decibels, to put it in context, is a sort of loud, it's kind of it's as loud as a motorbike would be. Um, I think I think a key thing to note, though, within the operations that Res undertakes is it's very consistent in the noise that it puts out, and that noise is much easier for people to deal with. If you think of a road breaker, you know, in the middle of the night, that's the kind of thing people object to because it's a repetitive and quite an aggressive noise. Res is very constant and flat, and and you're able to process that noise much easier. And like I said, 88 decibels is actually is actually not not that bad. Um, it's probably the, 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 the chainsaw and the vacex. So if you if you if you're used to using suction excavators, vacuum excavators, it's that kind of noise. It's about the same level um, as those. And so and so at, so we think it's it's much more tolerable and much more uh, friendly way, you know, to um, to to excavate than than traditional means. Okay, thanks, Ollie. 
So Ali, obviously there's there's we're, uh, you're going to be inundated with questions here, as, and as we'll try and get through as many as we can. But there's a lot of obviously technical questions that have come in on various components uh, around the blow ground sensing and the cutting. So just want to try and group some of them together, if if I may. Um, and really, let's start with the I guess the blow ground sensing and just sort of build upon build upon that in some way. So. What's the differentiating factor between our sensors and traditional non-destructive sensors on the market? Very good question. And I, I saw that coming up in a lot of uh, people's comments. Um, so let's, let's talk about the traditional methods of below ground sensing, how it's being carried out right now. There are um, some maps available from certain areas that are, some of them are very outdated. And they're usually mark out companies that carry out uh, below ground sensing. When we're talking about like ground penetrating radar and how it's uh, being deployed at a specific site, for, for example, uh, it's an operator that brings a cart, puts the antenna on the cart and then drags this cart in trying to keep parallel movements and then collecting all the data with the same length and then collecting all of them on a computer on board of this device. Now, the accuracy of an operator in controlling to make sure every path of the sensor is parallel to the next is very difficult. To mark out the ground and making sure every path is about a foot away from each other is also very difficult. So you always have this operator bias in the quality of the data that's been collected. Now, once the data is completely collected, this data needs to be sent out to a subject matter expert to review them, to process them and make sense of it. Then the results have to be sent back to the site and trying to correlate everything that a subject matter expert just did on the data that was collected to the ground condition after it might be a couple of days or weeks after data collection is done. Now the operators who are about to cut the road surface have to make sense and correlate all of this. And I don't want to even touch on like overlaying sensor data from different sensors, like an EM sensor and ground penetrating radar. Now, what, are, what is RES doing? RES, first of all, has a six degree of freedom arm that can articulate it with very accurate precision. So when the robot is moving the antenna in parallel paths, we can make sure that every pass is not just a foot away from each other. We can bring it down to like 25 millimeters from each other. And that's kind of like the accuracy that the hardware that's out there right now cannot achieve. So it increases the resolution of the data that's been collected. Once the data is collected, everything is being processed autonomously on the spot. So within 10 minutes that the data collection is completed, we have a 3D contour map. And then we have tools for our operators on the spot. The trained operators will be able to eliminate the amount of noise with like simple bars and adjustments, looking at specific depth of the ground and then make sense of that. Now, the best of all is once you identify your asset, the robot is right there. It just took like 20 minutes from the point that you start the data collection and have the 3D point cloud ready. So the robot will go and cut in the exact same spot that the sensor identified a specific uh, asset. And that's kind of like what you saw in all of these videos where we identify the crossing of two pipes, we cut in that spot and then expose that specific crossing, which is a very difficult thing to do right now in the market with the traditional techniques that are out there. Could you just touch on um, the types of pipes and did you have some electricity cables within that as well? Yeah, so yeah, so we have an EM uh, sensor on board that can find any live cable. What we had in the specific spot that the robot scanned during this field trial, we didn't have any live lines, but we have cable conduits that we have passed like powered lines. And the other um, aspect of this operation is because the sensors are being dragged on the ground using the same robotic arm in the same coordinate system, you can overlay ground penetrating radar data over EM data. And later on, if you want to integrate other sensors, let's say an acoustic method of non-destructive testing, that can be integrated into the robot arm and the result captured from all these sensors can be overlaid on top of everything and be 3D visualized for an operator to make decisions on the spot. Well, thanks. thanks for that, Ali. I think, uh, you know, I think we've tried to group some of these questions together and hopefully cover, cover a lot of it there. Um, 
just I guess moving on, really, uh, just maybe jumping towards more of this more of this sort of platform in, in itself. Um, one, uh, there's a, been a couple of questions really on the sort of dimensions. Obviously, I think we've mentioned the way, but you know, typical sort of dimensions of the system as a as a whole. And could you touch on around the autonomy? You know, is it powered by remote control via Bluetooth or is it radio frequency? Can you just elaborate on some of that for us, please? Yes. Uh, so on board of the robot, we have multiple computers that are in charge of doing different things. We have computers that are in charge of collecting the data. We have computers that are in charge of the autonomy of the robotic arm. We have computers that are logging the information and the state of the robot, like the orientation of the end effector, the state of the batteries. All of this information is captured and they're all communicated to a base station remotely through wireless communication to an operator that's at the site. So this operator is almost like looking at all the vitals of the robot. Now the data that's collected is also, um, there are two copies of every single data point that we're collecting. One is on board of the robot within a black box that's on board of the robot. And a part of it is transferred to offsite ground base that the operator can make processing, make adjustments. And to command the robot, there are multiple ways of communicating with the robot. One is through that user interface, which is the Wi-Fi communication that we have. For driving the robot, we have different methods of driving it. We have Bluetooth, we have Wi-Fi communication at the same time. Um, and then uh, there was another question about the sensor data, or I might be wrong. Um, yeah, I think it was just the, uh, the Bluetooth radio frequency. I think it probably covered covered that more so around the sort of dimensions of the overall machine. Oh yes, uh, yes. Uh, the dimensions are so right now the footprint of the robot when the arm is completely collapsed on itself is uh, ten feet long and six feet wide. So we are targeting to do an operation within one lane. Uh, so if we have to do road closures, we close one lane. We have the robot and then the tool cart on the side of it attached to the robot and it can carry out all the operation in that specific uh, footprint. Oh, thanks. Thanks for that, Ali. In terms of the, just thinking of this, uh, you know, in the, in the reinstatement side, Ollie, um, the process that we showed there obviously around keyhole excavation, is, is that something that's been um, approved as, a, as an overall process from a highways perspective? Yeah, yeah, and and Hawk are very supportive of the project, and, and we've aimed we aimed really to replicate all the good work that was done with Cor with Core and Back. And I've seen a few questions uh, relate to that, and, and I'll, I'll I'll pick those up now. I think. Um, so we've what we tried to do, and we did start just so everybody knows, we did start with thinking what we'd have is a barrel corer, you know. But what we found is that limited us to a very specific range of innovations within a core hole, and what we were finding is that not one size fits all for the types of operation that we need. And, and the reason we switched to a, a chainsaw, uh, one of the reasons was that we could now perform within the boundaries of the approvals around how cores are extracted, we could now create different shaped cores uh, or keys and also different size keys, right? And so now you're only having to think about innovating to the smallest possible um, and, this, and the most logical for a particular operation, rather than ha then the predetermination being a you know a foot and a half of of keyhole, and so that's the reason we kind of moved to the chainsaw. That it's cut and extracted, and it's it, it's bonded back into the ground in exactly the same manner and under the approvals of the existing core. There's definitely a little bit more work to do when we do move to irregular shapes. Um, and I've seen some questions here. There's no reason you have to use it in a, in a, in a, in a keyhole methodology. I think probably with the elect guys, um, there's some thinking to do about what happens when you remove a person from an excavation in terms of the size required for particular operations. So there's a sort of strategy thinking to do. In the short term, you can definitely use res to cut a square hole if you wanted to break up that material and then extract it, you know, using, using the existing um, using the, the the excavator that we've got or, or core and vac again if you've got core a vacuum excavator you can poke it in a hole that res is cut if that's what you wanted to do so there's there's going to be lots of sort of iterative stages to bringing in all the technologies 
that it's not a one shape fits all. I think eventually res will pick up the slack on a ton of operations. But in the in the short to medium term, I think there's an evolution for each company to go through that introduces the technology. We have a great core and back team in SGN uh, headed up by one of our operational managers. You know, he's got a couple of units. They're, they're doing it 24 seven. They're maxing it out. Um, we see res as a, a new tool for them to incorporate into that that slew of technology that they manage, right? There is a, there's a space for everybody. Eventually, like I say, Res offers a really unusual perspective on how things might work given its autonomy. You know, we build it as a two man team. It might be that you only need one operator to actually be on site and you could have a control room where people are monitoring a set of reses, you know, in terms of their performance. And then you're into the realms of, well, how do you deploy res? You know, is it is it that eight weeks ahead, you know, you're going to need it? Or actually, is it more like you've realized you need it? You know, I'm going to go on an app and order, order a hole for here, you know, tomorrow or this afternoon. And it's going to come and do that and extract maybe from a third party company. You know, so it really has the potential to really push boundaries of sort of convention particularly where we're used to planning very long-term works. And if you rethink them, there's a potential working in one lane to collapse those works right down to maybe a day. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a, there's a few range of things there, but trying to bring it no, together. That answers yeah, a few no, questions, I think. Thanks. Thanks for that, Ollie, because I think it's a really nice sort of link in, isn't it? There's been, you know, it's great that I'm seeing through the chat, there's a lot of uh, people showing interest, obviously our poll, and question three, 93% of the audience felt that there was potential applications within their industry for res, and that, that's fantastic. So, you know, just touching on that theme, I guess um, maybe maybe Rob, you could sort of touch on this. And it's really around, I guess, how can how can other industries get involved in, in this development of the platform and how difficult would it be for ULC to, to adapt the system to meet other applications? Sure. Yeah, no, I can touch on that. Um, you know, just briefly, you know, John had talked about our plans to deploy the robot um, on some additional field testing in the UK. That'll be happening over the summer. So one way that other companies can get involved is to uh, reach out, come visit our sites, um, provide other sites for pilot programs and in other industries. I know that there was a few questions in the uh, in the chat around other companies interested in deploying the technology on their networks. As you can imagine, it's a this is really new tech, right? This is something that has never existed, you know, in the world. And um, as we go through these field testing, and as we go through the commercialization process, as with any new technology, there'll be additional development process improvements, methodologies, training that we're going to perform and develop alongside our partners. So our, our, our partners are, you know, SGN now, but we're looking for additional partners to work with. Um, you know, part of the development process will include the addition of uh, more autonomy in the system, greater levels of sensing, and also different end effector tooling. I think that's probably one of the greatest opportunities for other um, companies and other industries looking to expand the use of this technology into their space would be to think about um, this as a platform that, that can fairly easily be uh, augmented with new end effector tooling. So for example, We've developed the uh, uh, supersonic air nozzle equipped soft touch excavation head. That's a tool that goes on the end of the robot. But, you know, as Ali showed you through uh, the presentation, we've developed a pile of other ones and also even iterations of those individual tools as we've gone through the project. And so they've gotten kind of better and better over time and have been kind of reimagined as we learn more about our environments. So I would think about sensors, I would think about mechanisms and applications that we could offset or support traditional work that, that are kind of high value items now that could benefit heavily from safety or uh, benefit from uh, additional autonomy. Um, the best thing to do would be to reach out to, um, to one of our team via one of the email addresses um, or even via the chat and we can get in touch with you to uh, to work through kind of a needs assessment and uh, and determine the best next steps. But we're excited to look for other applications um, with the system. We have the capabilities in house to do all of the electrical, mechanical, software uh, design to be able to design and build 
and field test prototypes. And then um, through our field operations group, deploy this as either a robotic based service or um, in another method that works best for your application. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, and John, I guess uh, just, you know, from your perspective, obviously Rob's touched on the, you know, the robots um, excitingly, it's coming to the UK soon. What's um, SGN's plans when it, when it finally arrives in, in the UK? I think that's the benefit of getting the kit over here. And I think the whole commercialization implementation will really be influenced by the field trials, Dave. But you, you know, the, the gas networks, just as well as myself, we've got the opportunity to look at a transmission use case, you know, in greater than seven bar assets, which are normally, you know, in remote locations. But we've also got the opportunity to look at distribution field trials, which are you know, 10 times out of 10 and built up urban environments. So I think those field trials will heavily influence where we take it. And, you know, we're really excited about those field trials coming up. And I think the, the opportunity to use them in different environments will also open up more ideas and suggestions as to how we implement going forward. And I even see a couple of uh, questions there. Well, it's, it's, it's more suggestions. I think it, Viv, Viv Harvey did put one on the, the chat about, you know, can you link it with database providing GPR surveys? We, we can do all that. Th this platform is really an enabler, not just from an operational perspective, but also from a planning perspective. And even, you know, the suggestion again, can you facilitate markups on the ground to visibly indicate services or assets? Of course we can, you know, and that's where these live field trials will take us. And, you know, I think Rob mentioned that Ali presented it earlier. If, if we see anything that we think we can fast track and put into another use, whether it be distribution, transmission, water, infrastructure, then we've actually proven through the project that we can do that, you know, in an agile manner. And, you know, I think the prototyping, the, the, the nozzle took maybe a bit between three to six months before we were actually field trialing having new iterations of it, changing the design and actually field trialing within a week or two again, you know, with those changes made. So I think the objectives haven't changed with the project, but what the project has given us is a bit of creativity to how we actually manage these R&D and innovation projects with a real view on commercialization at an early stage. You know, so we're, we're really excited about this. And, it, and I would stress again, I know we've said it in a, a couple of occasions, but it will be over here in the next couple of months. If there is an opportunity to do some collaborative field trials with ULC, with SGN or, or, or collectively, you know, then, then get, you know, get in touch because we're, we're keen to get a, a wider reach and we're trying, keen to expand how we use this platform going forward. I think... That's a really nice place to probably end the panel discussion. I know we've, we've tried to cover as many of the questions and group them together as possible. Um, obviously, the questions that we haven't been able to answer, we will actively answer them following the session. Um, as, as we alluded to and as John mentioned there, we, we are really keen to hear from you. We're, we're keen to learn more about your industry, the applications that this platform can offer to yourself. So please reach out to us on the on either of the emails that are provided on your screen today. And really thank everyone for their audience participation. It's, you know, that panel session wouldn't have been possible without you guys submitting the questions. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to create a little bit of dialogue, hopefully share more insight into this uh, exciting platform with you. Um, and again, thank you all for your time. I'm just going to hand you back over now to, to Alex, who will wrap up our session. Thanks, David, and thanks to the rest of the panellists. I um, just want to quickly thank all the audience for giving up your time today to be here, as well as participating in our polls throughout. Um, and of course, for the res team for making this revolutionary, revolutionary platform itself. Um, but yeah, like David said, if you've got any questions or would like to discuss the platform further, please see the email addresses on screen. But apart from that, thanks. Thanks again, everyone. And we hope you enjoyed today's webinar.